children, you're now dismissed to your junior church lesson. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 39 and verse 7. Maybe trying to make it through verse 18 this morning. The title of our message this morning is The Ultimate Motivation. The Ultimate Motivation. I want to thank Pastor Gabe for filling in last week, Easter Resurrection Sunday. In fact, I watched the whole thing recovering from my surgery. Gabe's sermon was so good, I almost got saved a second time. Appreciate that. I, w- I was, as you probably know, recovering from HIFU surgery, uh, which is prostate cancer in my apex. <laughs> and the doctor came in just before the surgery. It's about a millimeter, uh, centimeter and a half, I should say. And I was a little bit doped up at that time. And he came in and he says, "We're gonna. You're next, and we're gonna go in there and we're gonna kill it." And I felt like slapping him a high five, you know. <laughs> you just go do that. But I think things went well. He, well, my opinion doesn't really matter. He thinks things went well. I have a follow-up uh, visit in a couple weeks. So, But all things considered, I, I, I feel very blessed and grateful. Appreciate so many of yours, y'all's prayers and emails, texts, and so forth. Very meaningful. Thank you. The book of Genesis is God primarily raising up a nation, the nation of Israel. That nation has been birthed through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now that that nation has been born, it has to be preserved. The instrument that God decided to use to preserve Israel during a time of moral collapse and also a time of famine was uh, the 11th born of Jacob's dozen, a 17-year-old named Joseph. The Joseph story starts in Genesis 37 where Joseph, as a teenager, is betrayed by his brothers and sold as a slave into Egypt. Of course, Joseph has no idea what's happening in his life, but God knows. Genesis 38, which we spent some time on, is the explanation of why God is working through Joseph. Genesis 38, really, with Judah and Tamar, is a description of what would have happened morally to the nation had God left them amongst the wicked Canaanites. You'll remember where the Canaanites came from. They came from Noah's son, Ham, who uncovered his father's nakedness all the way back in Genesis chapter 9, I believe it is. As the saying goes, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and the morality of Ham was sort of imitated by his descendants who occupied Canaan. These are a very wicked group of people that will not be removed from the land of Canaan until the days of Joshua. But in the meantime, God could not have left his nation in Canaan because they would have become just like the Canaanites. And to prove that point, you have Genesis 38, where Judah, who of course, through whom the Messiah is gonna come, Judah, we'll find out about that later in Genesis 49, starts to intermarry with the Canaanites, 
He has his uh, descendants intermarry with the Canaanites. He actually has a incestuous relationship with his daughter-in-law who he doesn't know is his daughter-in-law because she's dressed up like a prostitute. I mean, you've got the whole shebang here in Genesis 38. You don't even need to watch soap operas anymore. There it is. And that's essentially what the nation of, of Israel would have become had they been left there. So God's goal is to take them out of Canaan and incubate them in Egypt for 400 years. God's instrument that he's using for this is this teenager named Joseph. And then Genesis 39 picks back up with the Joseph story. Now Joseph is in Egypt, he's in Potiphar's house, and guess what, his life is being blessed. Joseph is doing great, he's been elevated to uh, second in command, really, over all of Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house itself is being blessed because of the presence of Joseph. God said that would happen, by the way. If you bless Israel, I'll bless you. I mean, everything in the house, everything in the field uh, is being blessed, and everything seems fine until you get to Genesis 39 and verse 7, where we have a temptation and a false accusation. Genesis 39, verses 7 through 18. And as much as this seems like a strange turn of events, this is actually part of the plan of God to get Joseph into prison. Genesis chapter 39, verses 7 through 18. Um, here's the way it breaks down in terms of an outline. You have a proposition, verse 7. A refusal, verses 8 and 9. Persistence and more refusal, verse 10. Sexual harassment, verses 11 and 12. And then the wife, Potiphar's wife's false accusations, verses 13 through 18. Joseph in verse 7 gets propositioned sexually by Potiphar's wife. Notice, if you will, verse 7, Genesis 39 and verse 7. It says, Now it came about after these events that his master's wife, that would be Potiphar's wife in Egypt, looked with desire, sexual desire, at Joseph. And she said, now here's the subtle approach, lie with me. Why beat around the bush, right? There's a kind of a natural transition right there at the end of verse 6. It says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He's a good-looking guy. And she, of course, for sexual purposes, wanted to become involved with him. And so she actually here propositions him. So Joseph is under temptation. Now, Put yourself in Joseph's position. First of all, he's away from his homeland. He is roughly the age of 17. Genesis 37 verse 2 indicates he's about 17 years of age, meaning he is at the height of his sexual desires. Um, he is being propositioned by a woman who is married to a powerful man. We've talked a little bit about who Potiphar was. He was uh, one of the leading officials there in Egypt. And you would think that a man of that stature, um, he could have had probably any woman he wanted as his wife, I would think. He picked perhaps the most physically attractive woman available. All of that to say that Potiphar's wife was not hard on the eyes. Let's just put it that way. Joseph is away from his um, home, home and everything he knows. Maybe he felt like God had deserted him. And he has this opportunity to experience sexual pleasure in an illicit sense. Uh, today we call this uh, fornication. He has that opportunity. 
Potiphar's wife would be committing adultery. Now, in our day and age, this goes by a lot of different names. Uh, we have names like hookup, uh, friends with benefits, but let's just call it for what it is. For her, it's adultery. For him, it's fornication. And why not? Why not do that? One of the things that's very interesting about temptation is it has a way of rearing its head after a time of success. In fact, I was reading a, a book not long ago by Randy Alcorn called Money, Possessions, and Eternity. And he talks in that particular book about how men typically move into an extramarital affair after something has really gone well for them in terms of the world. A promotion, uh, more, uh, more money, an increase in pay, a raise. Um, and he noted that when men are in that particular situation, the temptation suddenly presents itself of, an, of exploring an illicit affair. Many men go down that road after a time of success. That is sort of how it's working in Joseph's life. He is succeeding. He has been elevated to the top of the entire household, and this is when this temptation presents itself. I do find this to be a biblical pattern. Daniel chapter 6 verse 3, it says Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps. But then in verse 4 comes the attack. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel. Notice the accusation against Daniel came after a season of elevation, promotion, and success. How about Jesus Christ himself? When was he tempted by Satan? Well, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, Jesus had gone through that amazing experience of his baptism. The heavens had opened. A voice from heaven, the Father, said, This is my Son, whom I am well pleased. I mean, you can't get a more exhilarating experience than that. That's at the end of Matthew 3. And then as you continue on through the Jesus historical account, you get to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, the very next verses, and Satan enters the picture. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Notice the temptation came after a time of exhilaration or success. Uh, this is the kind of thing that's happening in the life of Joseph. Now, why is that? Why is it that temptation seems to come our direction when things seem to be going so well? Well, I think the answer is Satan knows what he's doing. And he knows that when things are going well, we have a tendency to be a little less dependent upon God. God, I'll check in with you when I need you kind of attitude. There generally are two major tests for a Christian. The test of adversity, can you walk with God during times of adversity? And then there's the test of prosperity. Can you walk with God when things are going well? And from personal experience, to me, the prosperity test is a lot harder to pass than the adversity test. Because when things are not going well, we're on our knees and we're clinging to the Lord, saying, Lord, I need you. But when things are rolling along just fine, we have a tendency to sort of let our guard down. And that is when the temptation hits. That is essentially what is happening here in the life of Joseph. So here comes the proposition, verse 7, and notice his refusal. Verse 8, Genesis 39. It's three simple words translated there in the New American Standard Bible, which is the version I'm reading from. It says right there in verse 8, but he refused. I remember Nancy Reagan talking about dealing with drugs, and she had a slogan, just say no. Pretty simple. Joseph said no. 
And I'm here to tell you as a Christian, with the resources of God inside of you, where would you learn those resources from? Romans 6, Romans 8, Ephesians 1 through 3. We have been blessed by God with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, verse 3. That as a child of God, as real as the temptation is, you have the ability to tell it no. You have that power. You see, before I got saved, I sinned because I was a slave to sin. But now that I am a Christian, when I sin, I sin not because I have to, but because I want to. Because sin does bring that moment of pleasure. But the pleasure is passing. And the long-term consequences remain. You'll notice here in the Joseph account that he has his mind on the long-term consequences of sin. Not on the short-term pleasure that this illicit union with this beautiful woman is going to bring him. And so the power to tell temptation no is within your grasp as a child of God. And I make that statement standing on biblical authority. You don't have to sin as a Christian. You have the ability to tell it no, regardless of what temptation you may be facing. Romans 6 and verse 12 says, Therefore, therefore in light of what? What is the therefore, therefore? He just got finished talking about our resources in Christ, our co-crucifixion into Christ Jesus. When Jesus died, I died. When Jesus rose from the dead, I rose from the dead. When Jesus ascended back to the Father's right hand, I ascended to the Father's right hand, positionally. That is a truth about you. Paul says, reckon these things so. It doesn't mean Paul is Texan when he uses the word reckon. It's a translation from logizomai. It's an accounting term. You look into the record, you look into the financial records, and you see that these things are so. You look at an income statement and a balance sheet, and unless someone is doctoring the numbers, these are facts. These are objective facts. So when confronted with temptation, you look into the spiritual record book, Logizomai, you see these things are so. I have been co-crucified, co-raised, co-ascended into Christ Jesus. That is a positional truth that has happened to me at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. Therefore, as a Christian, when I'm tempted, I can tell the sin, no. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. I don't have to obey its lusts. Yeah, but pastor, the lusts are very real. I'm not disputing that. The temptation is very real. Joseph was under that. But the Christian doesn't have to succumb to temptation. Prior to salvation, you almost were a slave to it. But now when we sin, we want to. Not because we have to. So Joseph refused. Verse 8. But he refused. And then he gives two reasons why he refused. And this is where we get the title of this sermon, The Ultimate Motivation. The first reason he refused, I think, is more of a secondary motivation. But the second reason he refused is the primary motivation motivation. Second part of verse 8 into verse 9, it says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house and has put all that he owns in my charge. And there was no one greater in the house than I, and he has withheld, I'm in verse 9, nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How in the world could I commit fornication and you commit adultery with me and betray Potiphar when Potiphar is the one that put me in authority over this whole house? I mean, that would be crazy. 
I, I would be betraying Potiphar. I'm in charge of everything in this house except you because you're his wife, of course. If you go back to verse 5, you learn that Potiphar had entrusted all, there's a repetition of all in verse 5, into Joseph's hand. And what a stab in the back that would be. The man who entrusted you with all of these things, now you're shacking with his wife. Completely inappropriate. One of the things that's interesting as you go through the Joseph story is you'll see that Joseph, in so many ways, is a type of Jesus. Just as Joseph turned down temptation, so did Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, at the hands of Satan in the Judean wilderness. There's also something interesting going on here when he says, verse 9, there was no one greater in the house than I. Meaning, his, in terms of his role, it was the same as if it were Potiphar himself. Although we know that Joseph, in terms of hierarchy and position, is beneath Potiphar. Doesn't that kind of sound like Jesus in a way? Jesus shares full deity with the Father. In that sense, they're equal. They're equal in terms of value, or what the theologians call ontology, but yet the Son submits to the Father. They're unequal in terms of function or role. Fancy name for that is functional subordination. When Jesus says to the Father, not my will, but thy will be done, he's not relinquishing one iota of who he is by way of deity. They share in the same essence of deity, but they're unequal in terms of function or role. The Father is unique in his fatherness, meaning the Father is not the Son or the Spirit, but the Father and the Son share the same essence of deity, but not the same function. Kind of an interesting parallel with what he's saying concerning Potiphar's house. I'm the greatest in this whole house. But we all know that Potiphar is in charge ultimately of the house. And so he's given this motivation as to why he will not fall into this sin. I'm not going to sin with you speaking to Potiphar's wife, because I would be betraying my master, who was entrusted so much to me. But as you go further, he gives his ultimate motivation, which is the greatest motivation you can have as a Christian for turning down opportunities to sin. It's the second part of verse 9. How then could I do this great evil... And sin against God. Now, there's, there's your reason for turning down sin. The ultimate reason. I mean, why, why, why avoid sin? Well, I don't want to get caught. Well, I don't want an unwanted pregnancy. Well, I don't want to run the risk of getting venereal disease. Well, I don't want to destroy my reputation. Well, I don't want to lose my job. All valid motivations, but they are not the ultimate motivation for the Christian. The primary reason you turn down sin as a Christian is because if I do this, it's going to damage my relationship with God, and I'm here on the earth to glorify God. That's my purpose. So if I, if I sin against God, Uh, My thoughts perhaps could be on the temporal consequences, that's valid, but they're not the ultimate disincentive. The ultimate deterrence for sin is I'm stepping outside of my purpose. Because I'm here and I was redeemed and bought with a price for the purpose of glorifying God. See, there's, there's lesser motivations, but then there's the ultimate motivation. Have you ever watched how Paul teaches these ideas to the Corinthians, which was about as messed up as a church as you could get? 
He says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to a group of people that were leaving the marriage bed and going to the temple prostitutes, quote, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? You notice Paul doesn't go down the rabbit trail of, well, you know, there's unwanted pregnancies and there's venereal diseases and all of these kinds of things. He could have talked about that, but he doesn't. He says, don't you know? In other words, this is like theology 101, guys, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that your body is where God lives forever, So if you join yourself to a prostitute, you just brought the Lord into that sin because he's in you forever. Now now keep that verse on your mind when you're tempted to sin, when we are tempted to sin. That'll keep you from a lot of sins right there, if not all of them. Ephesians 4 verse 30 to a bunch of people that were holding grudges and unforgiveness. What does Paul say to them in Ephesians 4, verse 30? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You sin, you make God inside of you sad. You affected him emotionally, the Holy Spirit within you. You, We understand the Holy Spirit's inside of us, right? Forever? Forever? John 14, 16, and 17, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, speaking of the Spirit, that he may be in you forever. So whatever I do, gossip, gluttony, sexual immorality, drunkenness, covetousness, embezzlement, you name it, I just took the Lord who's inside of me into that sin. And that's the type of thing that Joseph is thinking about as this opportunity for sexual immorality has just been presented to his front door. I mean, number one, secondarily, how could I do this to Potiphar who's entrusted everything to me? But, but beyond that, how could I do this against God? Because the purpose of our lives is to glorify God, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're on the earth. That's why we're bought with a price. I love the way the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it in terms of a question and an answer. I love this question. What is the chief end of man? In other words, why are we here? You ever asked yourself that? What are we doing here? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Simple question, simple answer. And when I sin, I'm falling short of that standard, aren't I? I'm not reflecting the glory of God as I should. My professor, Robert Leitner, laid out the purposes of the church Number one is to glorify God. Number two, to edify the saints. Number three, to fulfill the Great Commission. But when I sat under his teaching, he was very clear that the primary purpose of the church is doxological. The church exists to glorify God. And whatever program the church happens to be running at the time needs to fit within that purpose or there's no point in the program. This is not just Dr. Leitner's theology. This is what Paul said. Ephesians 3 verse 21. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3 verse 21. The church exists to glorify God. That's his primary purpose. That's what's so impressive here about this 17-year-old. Turning turning sin down, or the opportunity to sin, turning it down. We believe here in what's called dispensational theology. Don't let that word scare you. 
It basically means three things. It's a consistent use of the literal method of interpretation in the whole Bible, which will reveal that God has separate programs for Israel and the church. But God's overall purpose in every age, every dispensation, is to bring glory to himself. Charles Ryrie says God's ultimate purpose of the ages is to glorify himself. Scripture is not human-centered as though salvation were the principal point, but God-centered because his glory is at the center. The glory of God is the primary principle that unifies the dispensations. The program of salvation being just one of the means by which God glorifies himself. Each successive revelation of God's plan for the ages, as well as his dealing with the elect and non-elect angels and nations, all manifest his glory. Everything God does in human history is designed to glorify himself. Here's a, a pyramid that we like to use from Dr. Michael Stollard, now of Friends of Israel Ministries. As you kind of go up that left side, it's what God has done in creation. Creation of the world, creation of the nations, creation of Israel, creation of the church. And as you move down through that opposite side, it's all of the things God has done in redemption. Rapture of the church, restoration of Israel, judgment of the nations, redemption of creation. But what's at the top of the triangle there? His glory. In other words, everything that God has done and will ever do is related to his glory, including your salvation. So when the opportunity for sin arises, we just simply say to ourselves, you know what, I'm stepping outside of the ultimate purpose for which I was redeemed. That's what Joseph is saying here. How can I do this against God? You know, it's very easy. I think it would have been very easy for Joseph at this stage in his life about to suffer another downturn. Well, I, I'm mad at God. I'm mad at my circumstances. That's what's so impressive about him. He doesn't go that direction mentally. He just says, I can't do this against God. Would it be enjoyable? Yes. Would it be fun? Yes. Would, would there be a short-term window of pleasure associated with it? Yes. But I'm not going to do it because secondarily I'd be betraying uh, Potiphar. But ultimately, I can't, I can't do this against God. Well, you would think the whole thing would end there, right? But it doesn't. <laughs> continued persistence, continued refusal as you move down into verse 10. Notice the persistence of Potiphar's wife. She doesn't take no for an answer. As she spoke to Joseph day after day. So this is not a one-time, you know, solicitation this went on daily now we have to understand this about our spiritual warfare if you beat the devil on monday that doesn't mean he's not coming back on tuesday jesus suffered the ultimate victory over satan in the sense that he turned down the three temptations in the Judean wilderness. Jesus won that round. And Satan doesn't just go over and sulk and say, well, I guess that's over. If you look at Luke 4, verse 13 very carefully, it says this. When the devil had finished every temptation, in other words, he pushed Jesus by way of temptation the furthest degree a human being has ever been pushed. And lost. Satan lost that round. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until, it says, an opportune time. Yeah, Jesus, you won this round, but I'm coming back 
for round two when it's opportune. Just because you have the ability to tell temptation no and you experience a great victory in that and praise the Lord for that doesn't mean it doesn't keep recycling back over and over again. We have to get into the mindset that we continuously tell sin no. It's a lifestyle choice, not a singular battle. And what does Joseph do each time he's tempted by this beautiful woman? It says in the second part of verse 10, he did not listen to her, to lie beside her, or be with her. There's the model of a person walking in Romans 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Because there's a deception, folks, that the youth of America are under. And I know it's a deception because... When I was their age, I was under the same deception. The deception goes like this. Oh, just sow a few wild oats while you're young. What does it matter? I mean, you'll get serious about Jesus later on, but have some fun. Venture off into whatever direction your sin nature is calling for. That is such a deception because Solomon in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1, who didn't follow his own advice a lot of the time, Solomon, says this at the end of his book on Ecclesiastes where he is sort of describing his life under the sun. He he went on a real rabbit trail, rampage in the final third of his life. And I think what he's saying in the book of Ecclesiastes is I've I've messed up the whole thing. As he's concluding his book in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1, he says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. And the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. You want, you want to walk with God? Do it while you're young. Because the seeds that you're planting while you're young are going to carry you into your old age. I think it was G. Campbell Morgan. He was asked, how is it that in your age, your older age, you're so uh, productive for the things of God? I mean, you're writing all these books, you're preaching all these sermons, and you're old. How are you able to do that? And he said, it's dividends being paid off from a well-spent youth. I planted the right seeds when I was young, and now I'm being carried along into my old age. The the, uh, so wild oats mentality doesn't tell you that. In fact, Joseph, we're not going to just end um, in our study of Genesis with his life in his teenagers, his teenage, teenage years. We're going to get a glimpse of his life when he's older. In fact, Joseph is going to have the opportunity to eradicate all of his brothers that were so vicious towards him, but he's not going to do it. He's going to say what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And he's going to treat them on the principle of grace. Why why would he do that as an older man? Because he set the pattern for his life as a younger man. By saying no to sin. In other words, the Joseph of older years came into existence because you have a young man making decisions for God in his youth. How about Daniel? Does God ever stop using Daniel in the book of Daniel? Not that I can see. I mean, the guy is like having some of his greatest revelations at age 85 through 95. As you go through the book of Daniel, which is carefully um, documented, the dates of his different visions in the book of Daniel. He started his ministry at age 15. 
And he has his final vision at the end of the book of Daniel around his mid-80s. I mean, why does this guy keep walking the way he is with God? It's very easy when you understand what he was like as a teenager. He was no compromise. He was given the opportunity to violate the law of Moses many, many times, right down to food. No compromise at age 15. So if he's like that at age 15, does it not stand to reason he'd be like that in his 80s? I mean, you, you don't just suddenly become a mature, spirit-led Christian. You have to start the pattern of obedience for an extended period of time. And the sooner you start, the better. I think it's Bruce Baker who's now with the Lord. I love his definition of spiritual maturity. He defines it not just as the amount of time you've been a Christian, but the amount of time as a Christian you have been obedient to the things of God. The more time you spend obeying the things of the Spirit rather than things of the flesh is the greater maturity a Christian has. And the more we progress in maturity, the more God continues to use us and bless us in our old age. I mean, no wonder Joseph is one of the greats. Look at this decision he made. Look at his doxological understanding of sin. Who, who is going to be injured in this? Yeah, there's, a, there's an injury vertically to my fellow, horizontally rather, to my fellow man, but there's an inju injury vertically that I want to avoid here. How can I do this against God, he says. And this is what you need to be telling your children and your grandchildren who think the way we used to think, the wild oats mentality. You're under a deception. You're being deceived. Satan is dangling the carrot in front of you. You think things are going to end up one way, but they don't. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's what the Bible says. Well, it doesn't stop there because it now moves into sexual harassment. Verse 10, as, he, as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. And now we have sexual harassment with some circumstances developing. Verse 11, now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household was there inside. Uh-oh. Nothing good's going to come out of this. No witnesses. You know, um, my professor, uh, Dr. Stanley Toussaint, had seen so many men, and women for that matter, in ministry move into adultery that he just said, you know what, guys, it was an all-male class, you shouldn't even counsel women, that's what he said. Because I've just, I've just seen this over and over again of gifted people that should be in ministry are now disqualified with ministry from ministry because of the sin of adultery. And it all starts with a man being alone with a woman under the guise of counseling her. So he says, you know what, guys, he was so tired of this pattern of fallen minister after fallen minister that he says, you know what, don't even counsel women. Now, I don't necessarily believe what he said regarding how a man should never counsel a woman. I believe, though, that a man in the ministry should not counsel a woman alone. I believe that. That includes extended emails, extended texts, one-on-one, -on -one, away from your spouse, where connections start to develop that are inappropriate. Don't counsel a woman alone. 
And you'll notice that part of Sugarland Bible Church policy is we don't put men and women in the same room by themselves. If a woman wants counseling from me, fine. But there's going to be someone else in the room. Always. And that goes with any sort of spiritual counseling type of relationship in this church. Um, I sat home one day. This was a few years ago, and I just made a list of all of the people I know in the ministry that fell because of that, this issue that today are no longer in the ministry. Or maybe after a period of restoration, they come back into the ministry and their ministry effectiveness is really not nearly what it once was. So I just started making a list, people I know personally, people whose stories I know about on the outside. And by the time I was finished, I was stunned at how many people I was looking at. I mean, Satan just takes down person after person after person like this when the whole thing could be avoided just by following some simple rules. Dr. Two Saints says don't counsel women. I say don't counsel women alone. But here you have a situation where she is with him by himself, by herself, and you know what? She could say anything she wants about him. There's no eyewitness there. And she does. <laughs> she just lies about him. Now, how do you defend yourself against that when there's no one else present to counter the lie as an eyewitness? The circumstances lead to her actions. We have actions from her, Potiphar's wife, and then actions from Joseph. Verse 12, she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. So now she's not just intimating sexual relations. She's actually doing something physical. She's grabbing his garment. And then look at Joseph's response here. Verse 12, second part of the verse, he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. You should take that word fled in your Bible and you should underline it, you should circle it, you should highlight it, you should put an exclamation point after it, you should put stars around it, you should take sticky notes and put it all over it. Because that is the biblical prescription of dealing with temptation. You just get out of dodge. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, Flee immorality. Every other sin a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Now flee from youthful lusts, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able so you're never going to have a temptation that comes into your life where you don't have a choice. He continues, but with temptation will, that's God, provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Every single temptation you face, I face, we face, there's an exit. Use the exit. Flee to the exit. Do not walk. Run to the nearest exit. This is what Joseph is role modeling for. Our problem is we just stick around a little too long. God says, get out, get out, get out. And I say, well, let me think about that a little bit. It's kind of like when the uh, restaurant folks bring around the dessert tray. And by the way, all that stuff they bring around is made of cardboard. 
Just keep that in mind. But it doesn't look like cardboard. It sure looks good. And they bring it around, you know, you, you know you're not supposed to eat it. Um, and they, you say, no, thank you. And they say, well, would you like to at least look at the dessert tray? Because they know that once you look, they pretty much got you. Um, that's basically our problem, is because sin brings to us some enjoyment, and we're not really thinking about our doxological purpose or how it's going to affect other people, we come under temptation, we have the way of escape because we have the resources of Christ Jesus in us, and we just sort of stick around a little too long. Kind of like Lot's wife, right? She looked back, and as my wife says, she got assaulted, so to speak. We had a situation, I'm not embarrassed to talk about it, um, at one of the schools that I worked for, of sexual immorality from somebody at the highest level. And I remember the board members telling us as faculty, look, Sin is so powerful that you cannot negotiate with it. If you think you can play patty cake with sin, you're deceived. I mean, if sin were so innocuous, why in the world did Jesus, as we commemorated this morning at the Lord's table, have to pay a, such an aggressive price to deal with the sin problem? Sin is far more powerful than you are. You can't negotiate with it. You can't dialogue with it. You can't play patty cake with it. You've got to just get away from it as fast as you can. That's why it keeps saying flee, fled, etc. And Joseph has a victory here. But it's kind of interesting how something that happened for good he left his cloak behind he fled so fast turned around to his disadvantage because the evidence is left behind which she manipulates verse 13 when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside if I can fill in the gaps a little bit hell Hath no fury, you know the rest of it, like a woman scorned. And he's about to find that out. But he's directly in God's will. Because he left sin. But what was good is turned around for wickedness. And because this so-called evidence is left behind, here comes the accusations. Look at what she says, first of all, to... Potiphar's servants because Potiphar apparently is not even home from work yet. It says in verses 14 and 15, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left this garment beside me and fled and went outside. Notice the expression he there in verse 14. See, he brought this Hebrew, which is how Gentiles referred to Israelites in this time period and even today as Hebrews. You'll see the word Hebrew again in verse 17. See how he brought this Hebrew in to make sport of us. Who's the he? The he is Potiphar. She's bad-mouthing her husband. Potiphar himself is blamed in front of the servants. Now, I'm here to tell you folks, this is the kind of woman to avoid. Um... <laughs> Particularly if you're single and ready to mingle kind of thing and you want to get married and you want to find the right person, any woman that will disrespect her future husband in front of other people, I don't care how beautiful she is. She's a waste of your time. 
Because the function of a woman is to honor her husband. The husband's job is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. But Ephesians 5 verse 33 gives the woman's responsibility and says the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Anytime a woman talks down her husband in public, that's not of God. A woman's job is to build up her husband, honor her husband, glorify, in a certain sense, her husband, not to malign him publicly. And then the husband, of course, has the reciprocal responsibility of loving his wife as Christ loved the church. And so she launches into this accusation of rape. We have no witnesses because they're by themselves. And so how do you defend yourself? That's why you avoid those situations of one-on-one -on -one to the best of your ability, which Joseph apparently, because of circumstances beyond his control, was not able to do. Because once a lie is entered into the public record, how can, there's no defense against it. You cannot defend yourself against a lie without witnesses to the contrary. That's why in the New Testament it'll say things like, do not entertain an accusation against an elder without two to three witnesses. Because anybody can say anything they want about anyone, anytime, if no one is there to counteract or countervail what actually transpired. That's what she is doing. And after bad-mouthing Joseph and Potiphar to the servants. I guess dad comes home from work and she's not done yet. Verses uh, 16 through 18. Now we see her accusations to Potiphar. Verse 16. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. So she's got a piece of evidence that she's going to manipulate. Verse 17. Then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to make sport of me. Verse 18. And I raised my voice and screamed. And he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Total lie. She's making here an accusation of rape against him. She has turned Joseph from the victim in this whole thing to the perpetrator. It's kind of interesting in verse 14, she says, look what he did to us. And then in verse 17, when she's speaking to her husband, she says, look what he did to me. What is she trying to do here? She's trying to get the whole household mad at Joseph. Let's get the husband mad and let's get the servants mad. He's trying to get the servants angry with Joseph also in addition to Potiphar. This is how the devil works. We have to at some point gain some wisdom into the strategies of Satan. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. I find today that most of us as Christians are totally ignorant of Satan's schemes. We, we don't even understand why half of our best people in ministry aren't there anymore because of disqualification. We don't even understand how Satan uses simple strategies over and over again. And if we would just do a little preventive maintenance, we could avoid a lot of these pitfalls and traps. And so things are going so well. Here comes temptation, lies, false accusation. Verses 19 through the end of the chapter, here comes imprisonment. But... Here comes the faithfulness of God. Because the exact same faithfulness that God showed to Joseph in Potiphar's house, he now shows to Joseph as a prisoner. 
So you in your life may have been mistreated. You may have been lied about. You may have had unfair things happen to you. But I'll tell you this much, God's faithfulness remains. God knows exactly what's happened to you. And he's going to be faithful to you regardless of the situation. Because that's God. And it's actually Joseph's place in prison that connects him to the rest of the story. So God, for whatever reason, didn't cause this, but he certainly allowed it. And God works all things together for good, does he not? To those that love God and are called according to his purpose. The Bible doesn't say all things are good. This is not good. But God uses it for good. And we'll see that next time, uh, beginning at verse 19, as we continue the Joseph story. Shall we pray? Lord, we're grateful for this ancient historical account and how it speaks to our lives. I do pray, Lord, if anyone is here that, or within the sound of my voice that does not know you personally, I do pray that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would understand those important words of Jesus Christ, it is finished. You have provided everything that's necessary to bridge our sinful gap back to a holy God. You simply ask us to receive by faith as a gift what you've done in our place. I pray for anyone here or within the sound of my voice that has never received this precious gift that they might exercise faith or trust into the finished work of Jesus Christ, even as I am speaking. And might today might become a new born child of God. We pray that this is happening in many, many minds as we trust salvations even now are occurring. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.